Good evening, good evening, and welcome along to another Robin Elliott tonight. We've got a great lineup of guests, as always. Things can only get better. Peter Kuna from D Ream is back with some brand new music. We're going to find out more about that a little bit later on. John McCulloch's going to be here telling us all about his latest novel, and we'll have live music in the studio from singer songwriter Stevie Baird. As well as that, Mr. Hullabaloo will be dropping by, and we'll find out what's happening with Julian Simmons. Have a look at this. Julian, you have done many fashion shows over the years, but you've never done one with an animal before, have you? No, no this is the first. <laughs> so, and that, they're going to think I'm the biggest animal, aren't they? Aren't they, buddy? He's not too sure, actually. No. So it's that time of year again. No, oh, no, no, it's, it's not. not. Yes, Pantoland has come to NVTV. Let's find out what's happening because uh, two of the cast members of uh, Sleeping Beauty at uh, the Courtyard Theatre in Newton Abbey join us now in the studio. And Pauline Carvel, I've got to say, I can't take you seriously <laughs> in that outfit. Why not? What, what are you like? Robin, this is your new wife. <laughs> <laughs> How long does it take to get the makeup on and get yourself into that costume then? Well, truthfully, uh, I slapped it on today, but um, yeah, I will probably take more care in my one hour call. Exactly. <laughs> Tell us who you've brought along with you today. Cause... I have brought with me a very dear friend. This is Queen Gertie. Yes, dear, you're very lucky to have me here today. Queen Gertrude of Ruritania. Wow, well, it is lovely to have you in the studio with us thank today. You, and I must say, your headwear is absolutely fabulous. Oh, thank you. Yes, there's a lot of Elnet in that, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about Sleeping Beauty then. What, what can we, we all know the story, but what can we expect from your panto then? Well, it's going to be a wonderful, magical pantomime. There's going to be songs, there's going to be dancing, there's going to be comedy, there's going to be lots of action, there's a dragon in it, and of course, the beautiful. Princess Aurora, my little baby Princess Aurora. She's wow. so lovely, isn't she? And of course, there's always an evil one. I'm oh, yes. the evil one, Robin. <laughs> so watch yourself. Yes, of course, and I, it's a really fun part to play, Robin. Um, I've always said it's better being bad in panto than it is being good. Absolutely, and I'm having an absolute ball uh, because I am getting all the evil of me out. <laughs> You'll be pleased to know. I'll be pleased to know, yeah. <laughs> so it is kind of something a bit different. You've done theatre and TV and stuff for many, many years, but you're kind of new to panto. It was only in 2019 when we did Aladdin with the lovely uh, Rosemary. Yeah, well, when I was younger, I did a lot of musicals, Robin, and Shakespeare and straight plays and stuff like that, and was never really, oh, how dare I say this, that interested in panto. Um, whereas now, the older side of me uh, just was so excited because it's just a wonderful theatre form. Well, I was going to say, Queen Gertie will agree with me, the panto is an art form, isn't it? Absolutely, dear. You have to be on your toes to do panto, I can tell you. 16 shows a week, dear, isn't that? I think oh. so, yes. And how many years have you been involved in panto then? Oh, my goodness, well, longer than I like to remember, about 20 years off and on. Wow. But it's something to look forward to every year, isn't it? Oh, every year, absolutely. Strap these girls on and get treading the boards. <laughs> <laughs> so, Pauline, it's been a busy year for you because the, the book came out earlier this year as well, didn't it? Yes, it did. And, um, and it's, it's gone really, really well. And, uh, yeah, I'm really doing different things this year and uh, embracing that performer in me, the creative side. And I'm so excited to be working with Mr. Hullabaloo Pro Productions um, on this particular panto. And the cast is just wonderful. And, of course, Queen oh, Gertie is just brilliant to play um, against, which I have to keep oh, her in yes. check oh, sometimes. Yes. Deadly and I feel like here. I feel like strangling her on oh, many occasions. <laughs> but I refrain today in the studio, Robin. Yes, okay. And what about big songs in the show? Have you got, have you got many of those? 
The, well, yes, um, I um, I have got uh, um, the Monster Mash, <laughs> and then I've got two wonderful original songs um, that are uh, just incredible, really good fun. Uh, Behold my evil scheme. Oh, yes, dear. And then Malevolent, because that's my name, yes, Robin. Yes, yeah, exactly. What about Queen Gertie? Any big songs for you? Oh, yes, I never stop, dear, I never stop. I'm not used to all the Mr. Hullabaloo and Nolene, the lovely Nolene, have written some lovely, lovely songs. So I've got a lovely number with Princess Aurora, all about a mother and daughter relationship and letting your little girl go. Well, it's oh. very sad. And I've got one where I'm uh, taking care of the baby. So I'm throwing the baby around to Jester Jingles. And uh, oh, <laughs> I've got quite a few others as well. I've kind of lost count, I think it all. So lots of songs, lots of dancing. Lots of fun. It's a very busy show for Queen Gertie, I have to yeah. say. Oh, it really oh. is. Well, it sounds like lots of fun. You're on at the fabulous uh, Courtyard Theatre in Houston yes. Abbey, which is a great little venue, isn't it? Oh, it's lovely. It's beautiful. Lots of room on the stage, but it's nice and intimate. So we're very close to the audience and we can have lots of fun with them, can't we? We can, and we're very close to the audience. Um, uh, pr probably they're practically on going to be on top of us because it's so busy. Um, but yeah, it's really, really, really great fun. And we're running Robin all the way through to the 18th of December. So Fabulous. there's time for people to still uh, book their tickets. Fabulous. Well, we look forward to seeing you both in Sleeping Beauty. Thank you so much for coming into the studio and joining us today. You're welcome, Robin. <laughs> That's scary. That's scary. That is so scary. Let's get another guest on now. We're going to take you back to the 1990s. And if I said to you, name a massive number one from the 1990s, what would be the first thing that would come into your head? 1990s? I couldn't possibly imagine. I'm far too young. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine it might be something like Things Can Only Get Better. Oh, oh yes. yes. Yes, Peter so Kuna and Dee Ream are back with a brand new song. It's called Pedestal. Peter will be talking to us right after this. Here's Pedestal.
feeling in my head, my hands. You just don't mean it in my head, my hands. I can't believe it, I just can't. There we go, brand new music from Dereen, and that's called Pedestal, and I'm pleased to say that my good friend Peter Kuna joins us on the line. How are you, sir? I'm really good. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for joining us. So we're loving the new song, Pedestal, but this isn't your first bit of new music in a long time, because uh, you had the single out last year, Many Hands, which was a great radio track, wasn't it? Thank you. And it's funny, because we're working outside the major studio system, so we're not getting any that kind of hype, but... The response from regional has been fantastic. I mean, you guys have always been very strong with us. So that's great. I mean, people are still getting to hear it. And um, yeah, we're still getting the hits, which is what it's about. But we're staying away from um, the as, uh, the mainstream, if you know what I mean, the, um, the major studio system. We're just doing our own thing. So we, have, we had an album out um, uh, the middle half of last year, Open Hearts, Open Minds, which is our fourth studio album. And then we just sort of, we took a notion <laughs> over Christmas to just get on with some of the new tracks for uh, the next album, which will be our fifth one. And um, strangely enough, it's like, it almost seems pointless now doing albums because um, of the way that the internet is, you know, you can just put something out and then people can wait for the next sort of installment, as it were. Yeah. So it's almost like, you know, like a comic book coming like weekly or monthly. Yes, yeah. So I think that's like, probably what we're doing on the lead up to the next album. So. Let's see. I mean, we, we're, just, we're just learning about this as much as everyone else, you know? So tell us about uh, the new song, Pedestal, then. What's the story behind that? Well, I didn't want it to come out as a revenge song. <laughs> 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 the director was getting me to sort of um, snarl at the camera last weekend, which was <laughs> not what, what I had intended. You know, it's in the old sort of, you know, the, the lip. Um, anyway, it's like, um, you know, I've, I've been through, like, like everyone has like uh, major uh, relationships. If, if, you know, if I think modern life is, is like that. I was uh, with, with someone for 23 years and we didn't split acrimoniously, but I was thinking about how it was that um, she was the one that strayed, if you know what I mean. And, mm. um, and so that was just, it was just in me. I just said, you know, writers just sit down one day and these things come out. I mean, I can't sit there and design them. Um, so I just, you know, I was thinking about how much I idolized her and how, disappointed I wasn't betrayed to be honest um but also it's got it's got a kind of it's not a negative song so much as it's 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 kind of uh what's the word rose tainted rose tainted glasses I think that's the best way to put it yeah because yeah. think about them in the best way you know I put you in a pedestal you were the dream I could believe but you just went on deceiving me um you know I had you know I, I idolized you up above everyone it's just like it's got that vibe about it and then Alan got hold of it and we started doing that Balearic sound, you know, it's almost like missing by um, everything but the girl. So yeah. it had that sort of, um, sort of, it's, it feels like it's, it feels warm and kind of, I don't know, it's got golden tones of like, you know, sunflower meadows in, in the south of France. That's what I was trying to do. So <laughs> hopefully people feel that when they hear it. Now, earlier today, I said to somebody, it must be uh, 20 years since uh, things can only get better. And then I realized I was talking nonsense because it's nearly 30 years, isn't it? I was just going to correct you there. It's coming up for 30 years. <laughs> 2023, I think it was his first outing. And by 2024, it'll be 30 years on the nose, uh, January 2024 from when it was number one. So, yeah, we're, uh, we're showing our age here, right? So those days were amazing for you guys. You were number one in the charts and you were all over the place. You were everywhere, weren't you? It, it was a very heady time. I, 
I just remember looking at the schedule one time, thinking um, and, and saying, are we, we going to do lunch at any point? He's like, you can, the manager is English. He's like, we'll eat in the car. <laughs> It just was like, uh, you know, thing after appointment after appointment, aircraft, uh, you're going to speak to the press on the aircraft. It was just, it was presidential. I mean, I, I loved it at the time. And, and in hindsight, um, I'm not sure I would do it again, though, because it's, it's, I think it's a young man's game, really. I mean, that, that level of intensity, you know. So when, when they call it a campaign, it, it, they call that for a reason. It's like, you know, you go on, you know, on a, on a war footing and uh, off you go. Uh, it was brilliant. Our feet didn't touch the ground. And we, we just seemed to bring an awful lot of joy to a lot of people. And that's a reward in itself, you know. So back then, you were obviously making lots of money. How excessive did uh, things get for you back then? I, I love my friends and family. So they all, yeah, I, I spoiled them quite a bit. So... Uh, that was good. And I had an entourage, uh, which was lovely. I can't remember half of them now, but, you know, team fitting at the time. No, it was great. And um, it was nice. It, you know, you got free stuff sent to you in the post, you know. I mean, what's all that about? Now, I have to say, I loved your suits back in those days. Uh, did the suits come for free as well? Oh, no. No, I was, uh, I was at the time, I was, um, yeah, I was very much into suited and booted, you know, going... Um, going out clubbing. I still I still do get suited and booted when I uh, get on stage these days. Mm. But uh, yeah, I, I had a two and a half grand a week suit habit back then. Because wow. you could be in the twice, you know? So they were mainly coming from people like Dexter Wong, uh, Willie Hunt, you know, that kind of, and some Paul Smith, uh, some of the frock coats were Paul Smith. So, you know, in the days when I had the kind of money, I could just go out there and not even worry about, uh, yeah. you know, indulging so you know i had to look the part so yeah i went out shopping on that front loved all that stuff so what's life like today then there's no big uh, record label or machine behind you but are you enjoying the way things are i think what we, we really enjoy when we get together and we really enjoy when we get the gigs but i'll tell you what you could park the traveling because the way things have gone now because everyone's got you know really out there to try and get traveling again the airports have got really busy and oh, they're oh, way over capacity and security seems to have slowed down so it's it's getting a lot of people's backs up um and you know the amount of time people are spending in airports just to get through is just like excessive compared to what it used to be i mean that said um i was with, we were <laughs> we were doing a gig there on um saturday night um and we were in kent and uh we were doing this kind of moat park festival yeah. and um a1 were on before us, the band A1. You remember the Yes. The, but I, I, I wrote A1's first three singles. Did you? I never knew that. Yeah, I know. And I, they came in and um, they were like, I haven't seen them in God knows how long. And we were just chatting away and they're going, Pete, you know, you helped us. You really made... I said, guys, we got really excited, you know, about being working together. And, and that's what that was. And it was funny because um, I just hadn't seen them such a long time. And uh, yeah, the crowd were going wild. But, you know, that's that's the upside of it. You know, you get yeah. as uh, as my wife said that you get to get paid to go out and play, play to hang out with your mates, and you know that's that's the lifestyle without the hassle these days. So life for me is I, I've moved back to Ireland. Um, I've got a nice place um, on the coast there, and I get good fresh air all the time. Now, I don't have the city thing behind me, but because of what we've done, I can dip into it and I can get over there and do the thing and then leave. You know, I'm not I'm not tied to being Pete from Dereem all the time. I can be my own man when I'm walking around my hometown of Derry. People say hi, but no one hassles yeah. me and it's all really, really cool. It's 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 a much I don't know, much better quality of life now I'm well in my late fifties. So what's next for you then? We'll be back on, on, in, in England again shortly enough. We, and there's gigs coming up in the early year. We haven't confirmed anything yet, but we'll just keep doing what we're doing and then make another a record. We've got a video coming out for Pedestal as well. And we just hope to keep doing what we're doing and, and hope that something like, uh, I don't know, some sort of um, apocalyptic event happens that we're invited to, uh, to head up, you know? So uh, maybe with the tonic people need for all these mad times we're going through. So let's see. Watch this space. And of course, things can only get better. It became a bit of a political anthem after a time, didn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, look, Labour wanted to rebrand in order to get elected. And uh, I think it was Lord Mandelson's idea to, to adopt our song instead of the red flag. I believe now that their next party conference, they're going to be singing God Save the King, would you believe? So yeah. Kim Palmer is obviously trying to align them, uh, to get them electable and, uh, and to get that middle ground. So, yeah, but lo loaning it to Labour back in the day, to me, it was a mistake. Uh, they took us to war in Iraq. We're, you know, I didn't want to go to war with anybody. Um, 
just a lot less of people around to dance and make good food and all the rest of it. So just quite bizarre. And that's, I've been politically homeless since 1997. And bizarrely, about five years after that, when the Tories were starting their new election campaign, I got a call from them, from uh, their, their headquarters, asking if they could use things from the better for a new election campaign that, that they were doing, which was going yeah. to take the money out of the you know labor. And I was like, good God, man. I mean, I've learned my lesson here. I'm really not getting involved in this anymore. I just want to, I just want to be a singer, I want to entertain people, and I want to sort of distance us from, from politics, you know, because we just we just want to make people happy and entertain them. We don't want to sit around telling them, you know, political stuff and you know, you're all going to hell in a handcart. That's not my vibe at all. Now, are you still an ambitious person? Are the things you still want to achieve? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I've got, I'm not the same. When I was younger, you know, when we all are younger, I, I had a real hunger, you know? And now I've, I'm, I basically, once I've come home to Ireland, I'm looking after my dad like four or five times a week. So I'm basically his part-time carer. I'm trying to build up my house down in Donegal. I'm trying to got workmen in at the minute. So I do a lot of that project management and stuff like that. And then, you know, I do music with that, with Alan as and when we feel like there's something we, we've got to put down. So life's very different. It's multi, more multidimensional. And I was saying to somebody the other day, I was going, um, um, you know, look, the older I've got, the more complicated things I've got, right? Because um, I just, I had simplicity back in the day. I was, you know, I was on the dole and then I had a record deal. And that was it. All I had to do was, make records and yeah. you know good and sound and that was it it's really really simple but now i've got friends and family and houses and and, all, and you know obviously stuff to deal with and officialdom and rec you know publishing it's just like some days i get up and i just like switch the phone off yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's just too much but so I'm being ambitious yeah i've still I've always fancied having a number one in America, but I think that's more a dream now than anything before that, that's become before. I just want to make my band busy. That's what I want. And I want to get us to a point where we can go out live in our own right, as opposed to being at festivals, if you know yes. what I mean. So yes. that would be my, my greatest wish. And then, so what we're trying to do in the next few years is build up towards that, that people know that we're, you know, we're worth coming to see, that we're going to rock your world and all that kind of good stuff. And then, we, we, you know, we're going to hold court. We're going to have a great night. Um, we're not going to be Gareth Brooks. Don't get me wrong. That's not going to happen. <laughs> but, you know, to 2,000 seater venues with all of our friends and family and, and uh, the people that like what we do in there, then that's, that's what I'm about. Sounds great. Well, the new single, A Pedestal, is out right now. Peter, as always, good to talk to you. Thank you for joining us. It's been great having a chat with you. And here's another fabulous music video from D. Rain. Here comes Many Hands.
Now, my next guest on the show this evening um, is originally from Belfast. He's uh, based in the UK at uh, the moment, but he's got this fabulous new book out called A Virtuous Killer. It's his debut novel, and I'm pleased to say John McCulloch joins us in the studio. How are you? Not too bad. Thank you very much, Robin. Nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Good to see you. Now, apparently it's taken you five years to get the book together and get it out there. It must feel good. Feels great. Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the reasons it took that long was um, a lot of us think we've got a novel in us. I, I did, you know, for a long time. And it was, then it was trying to find the time to actually get it out. Um, and the first draft only took maybe a year or so. But you soon find out that uh, writing is a craft yeah. and you can't instantly, you yeah. know. And I, I, had, I, I had done some courses on uh, internet and so on, but um, I took three goes at it. And within, the, at the end of the first one, I took professional advice, gave me some great tips. And then I did it a second draft and did the same and yeah. got a thriller writer who had uh, 13 novels published, give me great feedback. So right, yeah. it was learning the craft as yeah. much as writing the novel and revisiting and shaping it, reshaping. Okay, now it's set in Nigeria, which is somewhere you've been to quite a number of times yourself, haven't you? You've a lot, yeah. I mean, I spent most of my working career, formal working in international development. And uh, I lived in West and North Africa for eight years before actually going to university, I switched jobs and went to work for the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, running a consultancy company. So um, I knew Africa, but arriving in Nigeria for the first time in 98 was a real shock to the yeah, system. Yeah. Um, I mean, Lagos at that time, Lagos Airport, was a very dangerous place. And you, you were advised if, you're, if your plane was late, don't leave the airport, yes, basically. Yeah. I actually had uh, the British Embassy sent a, an armed uh, a, a, a driver and a, an armed guard with a rifle to, to get me wow. out of there. So it's a very, very uh, extreme place. You have ultra wealth. You have 50% of the people living in poverty. Um, it's been oil rich since the 60s. And this 1% has taken 400 billion dollars of oil revenue. Wow. That means, of course, they haven't been investing in services yes. or development. It's always been very uh, insecure. You know, before all this Boko Haram insurgency took off in 2009, you know, people didn't travel between towns after dark. Uh, in your home, you know, you could be robbed. And it was violent robbery, mm, armed robbery. Yeah. Um, but having said, said all that, um, I mean, there's a lot to put up with, obviously, if you're Nigerian. Uh, even the weather, you know, it can be extremely hot in yeah. the north, like where there's desert desertification, very humid, re torrential storms, flooding and so on in the south. But um, you'd sort of wonder, why would you want to be a Nigerian? But Nigerians are amazing. And this was one of the things that also prompted me to write. Um, with all that going on in their lives. In 2011, uh, there was a poll by Gallup of 52 countries. In which country do you think came first in terms of optimism about the future? Really, Nigeria? Nigeria. Yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah, so, um, but there was so much going on and I, I noticed that a lot of it wasn't being reported yeah. uh, in the West until 2014. There was 257 girls taken uh, from their school uh, in one night. There have been a lot of other things going on before, but this was the thing that kind of became news. And it only became news through a big Twitter campaign uh, called Bring Back Our Girls. Right. And so you then had Michelle Obama and Oprah, presidents, movie stars, tweeting Bring Back Our Girls. And it did raise the issue. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it didn't actually change things a lot. And because there's industrial scale corruption, even though people knew something had to be done, the West couldn't send arms because of the human rights record of the army. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't send money because of the yeah. corruption. Um, and so today you actually have this, this 
kidnapping hasn't gone away. Wow. Uh, in those days, you know, th those, those girls were being used for sexual slavery and as suicide bombers. Um, now, a hundred of those girls have never been rescued. They're still, still out there, if you like. Um, and kidnapping has now evolved into a major uh, criminal activity. Although some of these terrorist groups like Boko Haram and uh, Islamic State West Africa province are still engaged mm -hmm. with the criminals. Yeah. And th the reason for that is because the government couldn't defeat Boko Haram, um, they paid a big ransom to get a hundred girls back, give some Boko Haram prisoners back. Um, but these criminal gangs saw, ah, oh, hold on a minute, you know, three yeah. million euros, uh, we could do a bit of kidnapping. Yes, and so you've yeah. got this situation at the moment, which is causing huge mm -hmm. uh, distress and misery uh, amongst Nigerian people. Wow. So obviously the book, it, it's set to the backdrop of that, but it is fiction, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's deliberately fiction, Robin, because there have been some great uh, reports and great books. Edna O'Brien actually brought out a book in 2019 called Girl, right. in which she documented the actual experience of some young girls who had managed to escape. Um, but it tends to be read by the same readership, if yes, you like, people yeah. who are into, or in government, politics, international development, and so on. And I thought, if I did a thriller, yeah. and if I actually got inside the heads of political uh, figures who were corrupt and a Boko Haram terrorist leader, violent terrorist leader, as well as uh, the heroine in this novel who's trying to get her sister back, who gets kidnapped. It might, you know, as a thriller itself, as that sort of medium, be more widely read and more yeah. people be aware of the problem. Yeah, I mean, sure. I know I'm not going to change the world, but yeah. I felt strongly it needs to be written yeah, about exactly. and uh, I hope the external perspective you know um, will help as well you know not be frowned on. So the book is out now where can we get this from then? Well you can get it certainly at the moment in um, bookshops in Belfast and you can get it in on, on online in Amazon or and, and Kindle it's yeah, available yeah. there as well. Brilliant. Okay, so writing is one of your loves. Music is another one. And I have this fabulous CD in front of me here from a band called Swift. That was you back in the day. Tell us about this project you've got. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a great story, Robin. Um, Swift were uh, three Belfast guys uh, who knew each other in uh, Belfast back in the um, mid 70s. And um, we met up again in London, we were very into uh, jazz fusion, and uh, we practiced as a trio. And the original mem founder of uh, Swift was a guy called John Mason. He came over to London as well, um, but he joined a, a Northern Ireland progressive rock band, a prog rock band called Frat. Yes, who yeah. Many of your uh, viewers probably may remember. So we we got a new uh, pianist and, and sax player uh, from. London, and we were very focused. Uh, we rehearsed a lot, we started playing a lot, and we won a prestigious award from the Greater London Arts Association, which gave us sponsorship for two years. So right, yeah. we could actually play full time. Yeah. And that was unusual for a jazz group to yeah. have that, you know, five guys just focus entirely on the, the music and uh, play and perform and so on. But after, a couple of years, the, the sponsorship ran out and it was impossible to make a living from it anymore. And the band basically went its separate ways. Brendan, the drummer, joined the Rory Gallagher band, was wow. with them for 12 years. And then when Rory passed, he joined uh, Nine Below Zero. Yes. The yes. sax player joined initially Bill Haley in the comments. Wow. And then Joe Jackson did all this jump and jive stuff yeah. with them. I went into back into development and so forth. But um, in lockdown, we're talking 40 years later, mm -hmm. uh, I was looking for some jazz on the radio and I, I found Jazz World, uh, uh, Lindley Hamilton show on BBC Radio Ulster. And uh, oh, I thought this is interesting because he was playing some jazz, our Irish jazz. Yes, yeah. And he played a track from the 80s 
1980, in fact, Gay McIntyre and other legends from back in the day. And I thought, that's interesting. I wonder if Lindley ever heard of Swift. So yeah. I sent him a, an email. And this was a Friday night. And within a minute, he responded, what's your phone number? Oh, brilliant, yeah. So uh, I sent him my phone number. He rings, says, yeah. what's going on? I never heard of you guys. What's this, Swift? <laughs> uh, so I, we had a good chat. And he said, have you any uh, music? And I said, we did some demos. He said, send me them. Yeah. So, I sent them overnight. Saturday, he rang me back and said, this is disgusting. <laughs> it's how I described it, which I think meant good. Yes, yeah. Because he then said, I'm playing one of the tracks on Saturday. Brilliant. And he kept playing them every yeah. two or three weeks. So I had to ring these guys in Swift I hadn't seen, you know, in 30, 40 years. And said, you never guess what? Yeah. We're on the radio, <laughs> you know, uh, BBC Radio Ulster. And so we then decided, let's get the get, let's, let's try and get an album together. And one of the guys, Larry Dundas, the uh, guitarist uh, from Belfast, he had spent 30 odd years building his home studio and using new technology in uh, lockdown, we managed to record remotely and we'd do a, a basic track, you know, um, Larry would do, would do it on a computer and then send it to Brendan on the drums. He, the drums would computer track would be removed, Brendan would put them in, it'd come to me, I'd do the same on bass. Hugh, our pianist, would do the same. Back to Larry, we'd add guitar. And then um, we needed a sax player, a trumpet yeah. player. And I got back to Lindley and I said, would you... No better man for said, the job, yeah. Always yes, he said. <laughs> So um, Bren, um, he played on the first uh, track that we recorded. Yeah. And not only that, but he amazingly got in touch with uh, two top uh, sax players, I'd say top sax players in Europe, Derek Doc O'Connor and uh, Michael Buckley. Mm -hmm. And they, they played uh, soprano sax and, and tenor sax in a couple of tracks. In fact, Lindley and Michael played together on the final track we did. And then Brennan had been doing some session work with a top session guy called Frank Mead, who's played with everybody from Paul McCartney to Eric Clapton, you know, Gary Moore. Yeah. You know, you'll find Frank Mead yes, yeah. on saxophone. And he did a couple of tracks. And then Brendan's daughters came in. They play in a, Catherine and Jennifer play in, a, in an indie band called Indian Queens in the UK. And they did backing vocals. Maggie's wife even took some interesting photographs. So it was a real yeah. Neil family affair. Oh, brilliant, in the end. brilliant. And uh, yeah, so, and amazingly, the album came out, was released in the same week as the book. So, I mean, there you fantastic. Go. And I love the photograph in there, 40 years apart on the same location in London. That's amazing. Yeah, 1976, you have five of his uh, houses of parliament in the background. And uh, we still had that photograph and uh, it, was, it was a good quality black and white photograph yeah. at the time. So uh, we went back uh, a couple of months ago to uh, the South Bank, yeah. took a couple, took, took another photograph, trying to stand almost in the same place, you know, in the same uh, stance as uh, yeah. you know, individually. And yeah, it was a nice way to put it on the album because the album's called In Another Lifetime. So you've got the two exactly, lifetimes. Exactly, yes, yes. So where besides. can we get the album then? The album uh, you can get from um, Swift Six uh, Bandcamp, mm -hmm. um, the CD and download. It can be downloaded from all the usual, you know, uh, Spotify, iTunes, yeah. uh, Amazon Brilliant. as well. Good stuff. Well, John, thank you for coming in. The book is out now as well, A Virtuous Killer. You've got to read this. John, thank you so much thank for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Robin. Right, time for some fabulous live music here in the NVTV studios. Here with a new song called My Hometown, here is Stevie Baird. I remember when I was five years old, no wonder in the streets. People passing by with a sugar hill, never knowing who you meet. Taken round by my mother's hand as she walked around with grace. Said, Son, I know you're gonna be someone, but don't forget this little old place. In my hometown, there's a story and a name. In my hometown, 
hometown there's whispers in the rain in my hometown this place I thought I'd leave well, you can take the boy from the town but that empty space remains in my hometown Back in my high school days, I'd play this old guitar. I lost touch with those busy streets, I would see them from afar. Sit around, think of the time I'd leave this place one day. The wonder had gone from my growing eyes, my younger years were on the fade. In my hometown, there's a story and a name. In my hometown, there's whispers in the rain. In my hometown, this place I thought would leave. Well, you can take this boy from the town, but that empty space remains. In my hometown. In my hometown. My hometown, this story and name. In my hometown, there's whispers in the rain. In my hometown, this place I thought I'd leave. Well, you can take this boy from the town, but that empty space remains. In my hometown. In my hometown. Hometown. As I grew up, the streets they changed. What was there had gone away. No sound of cars, busy streets, no stories of old days. And we'll have some more live music in the studio from Stevie a little bit later on. But right now, Panto Land really has come <laughs> to NVTV. Look at these two fabulous characters. Mr. Hullabaloo is here. How Hello. are you? I'm very well, Robin. Thank you. How are you? I'm very well. So it's obviously your favourite time of the year, isn't oh, it? Oh, we love Christmas, don't we, Jingles? Yep, it's one of our favourite times of year and a very busy time of year as well. I would imagine so because uh, you're busy with Panto as well at the moment. We saw your Panto cast earlier oh, on there. They are a fabulous cast. We are so excited to be working with them. And believe it or not, we have four pantomimes. Really? So we have one in Antrim Unit Nabe, we're doing Sleeping Beauty there. We have Snow White at the Riverside in Coleraine. Cool and then we have a touring panto of Sleeping Beauty, which is going to the Ancarn Centre in Mahara. And also Oma in January as well. So there after Christmas, the panto's back. Exactly. <laughs> Lots to look forward to. You've brought this lovely guy along with you today. I have, who I yes. remember introducing him on stage in Ballyclare or somewhere years ago. Wow, that's right. So you've met Robin before, Jingles. Jingles has lots of friends. Yes, <laughs> obviously that does, doesn't say very much, but... Um... Well, he talks with his jingly bells. Isn't that right, Jingles? <laughs> yes, he does. And for Christmas, he's hoping that Santa will bring him a new hat. Ah, lovely. Absolutely. Lovely. <laughs> for people who don't know, tell us about Mr. Hullabaloo, because you guys have been producing shows for many years now, haven't We you? have. Well, myself and Nolene, my lovely colleague, decided to set up the business. Um, we were teachers, nursery and primary school teachers, and 18 years ago, we decided to leave the classroom to set up a children's interactive theatre company, and we have never looked back. Um, I'd imagine I risky at the start to do. At the start, we thought we are taking a chance yeah. doing it, but um, children, we believe it's important that they use their imagination. And when we used to be teachers in the classroom, we would read stories. And it used to be when you told a story, and if you told a story well, you could hear a pin drop. And yeah. I thought this could be bigger. I, yes. used to, I used to arrive at school like Mary Poppins with my box of tricks, <laughs> you know, my magic bag. And when the puppets came out, I, it, it's sort of the children always loved the puppets and it was a teacher I worked with back then when she became a nursery school teacher 
One day she asked me, I was a sub teacher at the time, she said, um, would you like to come and do a puppet show mm -hmm. for my class? And I did, and that was the, the sort of basis of it. And then Noeline and I got together, came up with the name Mr. Hullabaloo. And from then on, we, uh, that has grown. We visit schools on a regular basis, nurseries. Um, we do live events and um, light switch ons, mm -hmm. pantomimes, and we also have our theater touring shows Brilliant. as well as educational resources too. So. And talking about the educational side, you believe the kids should be reading books instead of flicking through their iPads and things Absolutely. these days, don't you? Yeah. Um, as I say, we have been going 18 years and it's amazing the difference that we have noticed. It is so important to talk to children, read to children, because they will absorb what what they're hearing. Yeah. Um, nowadays, when we go to nursery, there's many of the teachers have said to us they've seen the decline in in speech and language, the lack of using imagination too. If you're sitting zoned out in an iPad, yeah. Um, our technology has its place, but if you're not playing, you're not. Children aren't actively using their minds. Um, we have noticed a, a, a dulling down in that, which is actually a, quite concerning too. Yeah. Um, but and you have your own range of educational books and things for kids as we well, do. don't we? We have a range of um, educational books. So we were working in those prior to COVID. And then when, when the dreaded COVID came in 2020, the printers all closed. Yeah. So it was ready to go, but we couldn't even get it printed. But we began to publish online lesson plans. And many of the schools and nurseries were able to stay in touch by doing those. And it was to offer parents ideas for what they could do at home and then once the printers reopened, our book went to press along with then all the educational resources to accompany the book. And you can even get your own soft toys of, you can get one of me, you wow. can get one of Jingles, and we've got Bob and Bear available and um, our other characters, Dotty and Trubolino, are on their way. They should be out next year. And they're scented too. <laughs> really? It's okay. Excellent. Now you've got a special gig. In fact, a load of special gigs coming up at Belfast Castle, haven't you? Yes, this is, this is our first time performing at Belfast Castle, which we're really excited about. So it's a brand new event this year. It's called Christmas at the Castle. And myself, Jingles, and lots of our Hullabaloo friends are going to present a magical winter wonderland Christmas stage show. And it also features a singing Santa. And then after the show, children can follow the magical trail into Santa's grotto where they will that. get a lovely surprise. So it's going to be very festive, isn't it, Jingles? And I think your first <laughs> date's on the 3rd of December, isn't it? 3rd of December, Robin, that's right. And it's on every Saturday and then it's Sunday the 18th at the moment. There's one Sunday date as well. Excellent. So. Well, the best of luck with that. Mr. Thank Hullabaloo so and much. Jingles, thank, thank you. you so much for coming in thank and joining you. us on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right, staying with the festive theme, we've been out and about at number two, Royal Avenue this week with the guys from May We Events to find out what's happening in the run-up to Christmas. We also caught up with Julian Simmons. Here's what happened. So we're here in this fabulous venue, number two Royal Avenue. They've done such a great job here, haven't they? Yes, we've been very busy. We reopened again after some building works there on Saturday. Over the weekend, we welcomed just under 7,000 visitors into our venue, our beautiful cultural space there this weekend. We had visitors who've been to see us before and loads who hadn't come in now to get this beautiful welcome under our gorgeous dome. So we even saw people from Dublin coming up for a visit today, didn't we? Yeah, that we get visitors from all over, where the place is an asset not just for Belfast, those who live and work here, but for the island of Ireland. We get visitors from all the different counties and we actually get visitors from all over the world. And when people come in, you saw yourself, they're wowed by our dome, yeah. the friendly welcome they get here in Belfast, and then they hear about all the amazing activities and events that we have on here in 2 Royal Avenue. So people love to come and visit us. So you've got lots happening between now and Christmas. Yes. Tell us about the Santa's post office over there because that looks fabulous. Oh, it is absolutely wonderful. So Belfast One are hosting Santa's post office. All the little children can come in and post their letters off to Santa. We have fabulously friendly elves who are very good at helping with that. And the place is just a real buzz to the place when that's happening. So we see this fabulous snow globe over here. What's all that about? Yes, that is our beautiful sensory igloo. So it's set up 
with Northern Lights projection, natural forest around it. It's brilliant to have a lovely quiet space in the city centre as well. We get a lot of feedback from families to say that it's brilliant for particularly those with sensory issues or autism that they come into the city centre and have a relaxed, quiet space where they can just chill out. But of course, it's fabulous for everybody. I know that's where our staff love to go sometimes for a little chill out as well. <laughs> Tell us about some of the other fabulous events that you have coming up. You've got Twilight Markets and everything, haven't you? Yeah, we have Twilight Markets coming up beginning of December. We've had loads of sustainable workshops. Most of our workshops and events are actually sold out, which shows the real desire and need yeah. for that sustainable element. I think you've seen some dogs Dogs wandering about in the background. We have our crufty Christmas fashion show on Sunday the 11th of December, 1 to 5, and one of our guest judges is Julian Simmons, so that is going to be great fun. Then we have a swap shop event on Friday the 9th of December with Another World, where again, that sustainable element where people can come in and swap clothes and, and bring home something new, but reused. Now, tell me about the cafe over there, because that looks amazing. Yeah, we're very fortunate. We have the amazing Yala Cafe. It's a social enterprise. At the moment, they just have a small space, as you can see up here, serving delicious coffees, tray bakes. But when we reopen the rest of the venue in a fortnight, they're going to have a lovely large coffee shop down the back where there'll be more warm food available as well. So people can pop in for their lunches, for coffee breaks. It'll be a fabulous place in the city centre. Brilliant. Well, if people want to check out your full programme, where do they go to? for that? Yeah, the best place for everyone to go is on to Belfast City Council's website or their socials. Just put in Belfast City Council to Royal Avenue and again search that on socials and that'll bring up all the links to to Royal Avenue. You can see our full programme of the winter's day. Well, thank you for inviting us along, Ted. It's been absolutely fabulous. Thank you. My pleasure. Look forward to welcoming you back. So, Julian, tell us why you're here today. Well, we're doing a, a launch for an event that's happening early December, uh, a, a fashion show with dogs, which is going to be... I think people are going to love it because the dogs are all great crap. This is Buddy, and he's champing at the bit at the moment. Sunday the 11th, that's the day it's on, and Buddy is going to be strutting his stuff, and I'm going to be trying keeping a semblance of order, which will be amazing if I do. Exactly. Now, you have a wee seat there, Buddy. That's a he's good boy. He's very good, isn't he? He's, he's really very, is. He's he really been doing is. a lot of photographs today, so I think he's getting that he's just about had enough yeah. for now. But he's very, very affectionate and warm and loves people. Julian, you have done many fashion shows over the years, but you've never done one with an animal before, have you? No, no this is the first. <laughs> so and that, they're going to think I'm the biggest animal. And aren't they? Aren't they, buddy? He's not too sure, actually. No. And what about this fabulous venue we're in today? This is great for Belfast, this isn't it? This really is. It's a beautiful venue, and it'll be great to come along to because it's going to be a nice afternoon. What about Christmas? What's your plans this year? Well, Christmas, uh, I'm going out on Christmas Day with friends and the rest of the time taking it easy. Don't like a big obstreperous as Christmas, no, to tell you no. the truth. Yes, yeah. I've done a few of those in my time and not doing one <laughs> this year. I, I always say that. And of course, we've seen you back on the telly recently, just before a Jerry Kelly show. Oh, God, yes. And I'm on the Kelly Christmas special, going Brilliant. out on the... 15th or 16th of December. So that'll be a, that's a bit of fun. It is, it is. Well, good to see you here today. And nice to see you too, and Buddy's all delighted too. Yeah, and good to see you on the NVTV <laughs> as well, Julian. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. There you are, Buddy. You've done very Perfect. well. So lots to look forward to in the run-up to Christmas at uh, number two at Royal Avenue. That's all we've time for on the show this week. Thank you to all the guests. Thank you for watching. And Chloe, thank you for working on the show over the past few months. Thank you, Robin. It's been a pleasure. This is your last show. This is my last show and I'll be sorry to see it go now, but no doubt it'll still carry on to the best of its ability. Of course it will. We shall miss you. Thank you for all your hard work in the show <laughs> and the best of luck with everything in the future. Thank you, Robin. All right, so all the staff are getting in on the show this week. You've had Chloe there. Stephen is usually behind the camera that I'm looking into now, but he's not because he's getting ready for another song. So here with a song called Chasing White Feathers to play us out. It's a song that's actually not about chasing white feathers. Anyway, here's Stevie Baird. See you next week. Bye-bye.
Walking shadows, broken arrows, holding the shape of a heart. Dark clouds of rolling thunder makes me wonder. Will I escape this time? I'm chasing white feathers that never fall. Your yeah, song never come at all. I'm chasing what's real in my mind. Like the bed on the end of the line. I'm chasing fall. While I kneel on sands, bearing my soul to the sky, hoping for water to drown on me, wash it down on me, take these chains from me. I'm chasing white feathers that never fall. Yeah, some never come along. I'm chasing what's real in my mind. Before they